We are continuing to examine Jesus' life and ministry in a series entitled, Taking Jesus Out of the Box. And we've learned a lot about who Jesus is and what he asks of us. You know, it's amazing when you think about this. Jesus' entire earthly ministry was three and a half years long. That's it. We've learned that most of it happened in the northern part of Israel, in Galilee. Jesus did go south. He went to Jerusalem several times a year, and he ministered to people not only to and from, but there in Jerusalem. But in Jerusalem, things didn't always go so well. The religious leaders didn't care for Jesus at all. They regarded themselves as guardians of God's law. The law is obviously very important to the Jewish people. It should be. It was God's instruction on how they should live. So, these religious leaders thought to help the Israelites fully obey God's law, they would add and promote clarifications. And the problem with these clarifications, <laughs> they weren't approved by God. They didn't come from God. So Jesus not only did not follow them, he publicly condemned many of them. Now this angered the religious leaders to the point that some of them wanted Jesus dead. On top of this, you have Jesus' ministry gathering lots of attention. Huge crowds coming out to see him, hear him, to be healed by him. And when they would listen to him teach, there were times he came down hard on these religious leaders, the teachers of the law. I want you to watch an actor's betrayal of Jesus sharing select portions of Matthew 23 word for word. You'll see how boldly Jesus confronted these religious leaders, teachers of the law, with truth. Truth they didn't want to hear. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. Woe to you, blind guides! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin. But you have neglected the more important matters of the law. Justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You blind guides! You clean the outside of the cup and dish. But inside, they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee! First clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. You're like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. You snakes! You brood of vipers! You can see why they felt so threatened by Jesus. He was just telling the truth. He's come as their Messiah to save them from their sin and death, to save the world. But these religious leaders are so wrapped up in their own authority and prominence, they couldn't see Jesus for who he was. He was their savior, and they wanted him dead. Now, this is the environment that Jesus and the disciples are now entering into as they arrive to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And with Jesus fresh off his miracle, raising Lazarus, a four-day dead man, the religious leaders, the teachers of the law, felt like they had to get rid of Jesus. Only one problem. Many of the people who are arriving to celebrate the Passover like him. So the religious leaders have to be careful. So they're planning to publicly discredit him. As Jesus would teach, they would try to trick him and make him look bad. Now that we have all of this as the background, let's turn together to Mark chapter 12. Jesus regularly used parables or stories in his teaching. And on this occasion that we're looking at, he's just used a parable that depicted the religious leaders as wicked tenant farmers. And so they're pretty upset about this. Uh, the religious leaders feel like it's time to bring Jesus down. Look with me, chapter 12 verse 14. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you're a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar 
or not. Now, you got to realize, they don't believe what they're saying. They're just trying to look respectable to the crowd. And they're laying a trap, so they're trying to bring Jesus' defenses down. And then they throw out the question. They ask, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, this is a catch-22. If Jesus says, yes, it's right, then the crowd will take offense to it. They can't stand Rome. But if Jesus says, no, it's wrong, He's just picked a fight with Rome, and the religious leaders will have real evidence to report him. Not to mention there are all kinds of Roman soldiers around. It's Passover. So Jesus is trapped either way. Look at verse 15. Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why are you trying to trap me? He asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. A denarius is a Roman coin that equaled a day's wages. Notice that Jesus doesn't have one. He has to ask them for one so that he can show them. Look at verse uh, 16 and 17. They brought the coin and he asked them, Whose portrait is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And they were amazed at him. Jesus not only doesn't fall for their trap, he cleverly finds a way out and teaches everybody a lesson. Now, the Roman Caesar is viewed by the Romans as a god, and the coin has his image engraved on it. Now, I want you to remember back to the Ten Commandments. What does commandment number one say? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And commandment two, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. The religious leaders were supposed, who are supposed to revere and encourage people to obey God's law were carrying engraved images of a false god. <laughs> Who's trapped now? Jesus says, give to Caesar what's Caesar's. Obviously, the money's his, his image is on it. So give him his money. But Jesus continues, give to God What's God's? And what's he referring to? Them, the crowd, each and every one of them, and us. We bear God's image, Genesis 1.27. He created all of us. We belong to him. Give to God what belongs to God. In other words, give him you. Give him your life. Their trap has completely backfired on them. That only makes them more angry. But still, they're impressed with Jesus' wisdom. Meanwhile, while Jesus and the disciples are in Jerusalem, Judas slips away and he makes a visit to some religious leaders. He's planning on selling Jesus out. Why? I mean, he's been with Jesus for a few years now. He, he's seen Jesus' miracles, his power. He's heard the teaching. Why would he do this? Well, some Bible teachers believe that he's doing this because he doesn't like the direction Jesus' ministry is going. It's possible that Judas wants a ruling warrior messiah, one who's going to kick out Rome from Israel. And he knows Jesus has the power to do it, but Jesus doesn't seem too interested in this direction. So, possibly Judas is forcing Jesus' hand. He's going to make Jesus fight when the temple cards, guards come to arrest him. Judas is going to force Jesus to be the messiah he wants. And Satan then uses all of this for his own advantage to destroy Jesus. Now, all of this is possible. Maybe this is exactly what Judas is thinking. It's also possible that Judas isn't a true follower of Jesus, and Satan just seizes the weakness to destroy Jesus. Either way you go, things are coming to a head. It's time for the Passover meal. It's arriving very quickly, so some of the disciples come to Jesus and ask, where do you want us to set things up? And Jesus doesn't give them an exact location, most likely because he's on to Judas. He doesn't want this important time with the disciples to be interrupted with an arrest. Look with me. Mark chapter 14, and we'll begin with verse 13. So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. 
and say to the owner of the house he enters, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So Jesus and the rest of the disciples later meet up with these guys and they're preparing to serve the meal. And then Jesus does something very unexpected. Turn with me, if you would please, to John chapter 13. So as everybody gathers around the tables for the meal, Jesus takes off his outer garment, he grabs a towel and a basin of water, and he begins washing the disciples' feet. Now it's important that we understand, uh, foot washing was very common in Jesus' day. You walk around all day on dirty roads in sandals, you get your feet dirty, and with all the extra people in town, there were extra animals in town they probably stepped in some things they didn't want to step into. So it's totally normal to enter a home in Jesus' day, especially if you're there as a guest for a meal, and somebody there washes your feet. But it's totally normal to be done by a servant. Jesus is their rabbi. He's their leader. They should be serving him, not him serving them, not in this way. Jesus takes the role of a servant as he washes their feet. And this is very uncomfortable for them. Peter is so put off by this that he tells Jesus, you shall never wash my feet. See, Peter doesn't understand that the way of Jesus is the way of the servant, the way of the towel. Look with me, John chapter 13, beginning with verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Jesus says, by doing this, I have set you an example. What I have done for you, you are to do for others. Jesus is setting an expectation for all who follow him to serve. To be servants. The way of Jesus is the way of the servant, the way of the towel. He's not commanding that all of us are to get together and wash each other's feet necessarily, although there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's a great experience and there's a whole lot to learn from it. But foot washing isn't common in our culture. Jesus isn't saying you've got to wash each other's feet. He's saying be willing to humble yourself and serve others in unexpected ways. We're followers of Jesus. So this is what we're to do. So this week, even with all of the social distancing, I want you to find a way to serve somebody in an unexpected way. Maybe you need to set a reminder, make a note, set an alarm on your phone, whatever it takes. Make a point to serve in an unexpected way this week. Now, Jesus expects this from us. He says in verse 17, Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Maybe for you, it's a word of encouragement for somebody, helping somebody. Maybe it's serving a neighbor or a friend or a coworker, your spouse, a family member. Make some cookies for somebody, <laughs> whatever. Jesus expects those who follow him to go the way of the servant, the way of the towel getting involved, you know, being active, not holding back. You know, this coronavirus, this stay in place order that we've all been under, I don't know about you, but for me, I have allowed it to excuse me from serving people, from loving other people. Let me give you an example. We have uh, some neighbors and they set bags on our porch for the girls and they had all kinds of goodies, some activities just for the girls. Now, these folks don't even go to church. Why didn't I think of that? 
we have another set of neighbors that brought walkie-talkies over for our girls so that they could talk back and forth with their kids because they couldn't play together with the social distancing. Wasn't that incredibly nice of them? These folks don't even go to church. I'm the Christian. Why didn't I think of something that thoughtful? Social distancing has its place. We need to make sure that we're keeping each other safe. But you know what? There are still lots of ways we can serve and we can share God's love. The way of Jesus is the way of the servant. And are we going to go that way? Jesus says in Matthew chapter 20, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. This is an essential part of us fulfilling our mission, our purpose as a church. What is it? We exist to produce fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ who love God and people. How are we going to do that? By knowing God, by growing in our relationship with Him and others, and going, serving Him, sharing His love with others, sharing good deeds. The way of Jesus is the way of the servant, the way of the towel. I want to challenge you. Serve somebody this week. Make a special effort to serve in an unexpected way. It's the way of Jesus. And if we're going to be followers of Jesus, it needs to be our way too, normally. Husbands, find an unexpected way to serve your wives. Um, wives, find a, a way that you can serve your husband in a way he doesn't expect you to. Students, who are you supposed to uh, serve? How about your parents? How about your siblings? That's unexpected. Did you know over 20 times in the Bible Jesus says, follow me? This is one of the ways we're to do that. I tell you what, it's an area I can sure improve in. Service, whether it's a friend, a neighbor, a relative, or a complete stranger. Follow Jesus and serve. A couple years ago, several years ago from now, uh, my family and I were at Red Lobster and I had to use the restroom. So I got up to go and as I walked by the service desk, there was an older gentleman buying a thousand dollars worth of $20 Red Lobster gift cards. Now, curiosity got the best of me. So I had to ask, what are all these for, sir? And the guy said that he gives them away. God's blessed him. He wants to bless others. And then he told me how he was at a nursing home and how he gave a card to one of the kitchen workers later that evening to one of the house cleaners. He said to me, you should have seen the look on their faces. The way of Jesus is the way of a servant, the way of a towel. So, I want to challenge you. Serve somebody this week in an unexpected way. Doesn't have to cost money. Doesn't have to be giving away gift cards necessarily. But what if, what if this was the way of life for all Christians, all followers of Christ? How would that change the perception of Christianity to the world? To Pekin. Jesus says, I have set you an example. You do what I have done for you. He expects this from us. Now, for some of us, you don't need to serve more. You need to allow others to serve you. Don't refuse like Peter did. Allow others to have the blessing of serving you. Sometimes we're in situations where we have to have a hard conversation with somebody. You know, maybe somebody's missed the mark and you know, you've just, you have to talk to them. It happens. Can I encourage you? Bring a towel with you. In other words, find a way to serve them as well as have that hard discussion with them. It might make it a lot easier. You know, Jesus, on this night, he had two hard conversations. One was with Peter, and the other one was with Judas. Peter didn't want Jesus washing his feet. And later that night, we all know that he went on to deny even knew Jesus. Jesus had a difficult conversation with Peter, but he did it with a towel. The way of Jesus is the way of the servant, the way of the towel. By the time they had gathered for this meal, Judas had already sold Jesus out. He's just waiting for the right time to betray him. Still, Jesus has him at that table with him. He washes his feet, and a little later during that meal, Jesus says to the disciples, someone sitting here will betray me. And when all the disciples are looking at each other, Jesus looks at Judas and says, go, and what you must do, do quickly. Je Jesus had 
a difficult conversation, but he brought a towel. The way of Jesus is the way of the servant, the way of the towel. I have a question for you. Is it possible to believe that Jesus is the way and not go the way of Jesus? I think the answer is yes, as long as it's not all the time. And the reason why is because all of us mess up. We all make mistakes. Let's apply all of this today to our lives right now. Ask yourself, do you believe Jesus is the way? And if so, are you going Jesus' way? Are you following Jesus? Peter didn't want Jesus to go the way of the towel. And when he told Jesus no, Peter, uh, Jesus said, unless I wash you, you'll have nothing to do with me. Peter knew that Jesus was the way, and he knew how serious Jesus was about this way. He picked it up quickly, and he says, Lord, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Listen, when you realize you're not going Jesus' way, change it. Jesus' way is the way of the servant, the way of the towel. Do you believe Jesus is the way? Are you going that way? Jesus finishes washing their feet and he says, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. If you're a Jesus follower, make sure you're going the way of Jesus. Let's bow together. You know, before the followers of Jesus were called Christians, they were called people of the way. And the reason is because they were known for living the way Jesus lived. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. If you have any hope of getting to God the Father, then you must be going the way of Jesus. Are you? Do you show Jesus truth and grace with your actions, your attitude, your joy, your desire, your, your love, your service toward others? Jesus calls us to His way, and His way is the way of the servant, the way of the towel. Heavenly Father, You command that we are to follow the way of Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would help each of us right now to know, to grow, and to go the way of Jesus. And Lord, if there is anyone here listening, watching today, and they're realizing that they want to go the way of Jesus, Lord, it all begins by being a follower of Jesus, choosing Jesus, putting their faith and trust in him. Father, I pray that they would seek you right now if you're here and you're ready, pray with me. Just say, Jesus, forgive my sins. I believe and trust who you are and what you've done for me, that you went to the cross, that you took on the punishment of my sin, that you raised from the dead three days later for me. I turn from my sin. I put my faith and trust in you. Help me to follow you the rest of my life. Follow the way of Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.